agintariak, lagunak, bertaratu zareten guztiak eta etxetik jarraitzen gaitu zuenak, ongi etorri udaikastaroetara. Egun señalatua da guretzat gaurkoa eta benetan eskerturi gaude zuen parte hartzearekin. Udaikastaroen donostia iraunkortasun foroa aurkeztuko dugu gaur eta foroaren jarduera irekiei asiera emango diegu. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por acompañarnos en los cursos de verano de la UPVHU en un día muy señalado para nosotros en el que presentamos el Foro Donostia de Sostenibilidad y damos comienzo a las actividades abiertas de este foro. El Foro Donostia es una plataforma abierta de contenidos formativos y divulgativos en la que se ofrecen respuestas a los temas de sostenibilidad. Cuestiones como el cambio climático, la conservación de la biodiversidad, la economía circular, la transición energética, que forman parte ya de nuestro vocabulario diario y lo harán mucho más en el futuro, son explicadas de forma sencilla y accesible por expertas y expertos del máximo nivel. El ciclo de entrevistas que hoy comenzamos y que están programadas a lo largo del mes de septiembre contará con estos expertos como los Premios Fronteras del Conocimiento de la Fundación BBVA. Para la presentación de esta plataforma contamos con la presencia de los representantes institucionales que apoyan la iniciativa y que han tenido la amabilidad de acompañarnos hoy aquí, Benetan Esquerri Casco. Foruaren sergaitia eta nondik norakoak asaltzeko, ni izenetik hasiko nintzateke. Eta nor egokiagoa horretarako donostiako alkatea bera baino. Eneko goia donostiako alkatea, zein da donostia foruaren izenaren jatorria? Bueno, uste eta ukentzeko baimena daukagu da, momentu batez besterik ez daba. Izenaren jatorria dudari gabe, bat donostiak aurrean dituen erronkei aurre egiteko ezagutzaren alde egiten duen apostu horren izdada garbia da, ez? Nik uste dut, gaur inoiz baino gehiago esan dezakegu da hori, ez? Bizidegun egoera honetan, ezagutza dela, hain zuzen ere erronka aurre handiei aurre egiteko daukagun tresnarik importanteena. Eta gure hiriak beti egindu horren aldeko apustua eta udako ikastaroak hemen izatearen izatea horren adierazgarri dira dudari gabe. Itziar etorri zitzaigunean, hain zuzen ere, proposamen hau egitera nik garbi ikusi nuen, ez? Bete-betean jotzen zuela, hain zuzen ere, guk, geuk, gure hiriaren plan estrategikoan jorratzen ari geran nildo nagusiek nekin. Ez bakarrik donostiak, hiri guztiak gaude, hain zuzen ere, bai gizarte mailan, ekonomi mailan eta inguru giro mailan iraunkortasun apustu bat egitearen alde, Eta ezagutza hau donostian izatea, bat dudari gabe, abantaila ikaragarria zela suposatzen genuen, dela pentsatzen dugun eta horregaitik foro hau hemen izatearen aldeko apustu hori, ez? Dauzkagun galdera askori erantzuna eskaintzeko bide izango dedakoan eta berriro diot ezagutza eta jakintza izango dedako baita ere kasu honetan dauzkagun erronka hori guztiei aurre egiteko tresna nagusiena da izan behar duedako. Ezkerrik asko, Elena Moreno, Jarduneko Eusko, Jaularitzako, Ingurumen, Zailburu Ordea, nos gustaría preguntarte, teniendo en cuenta que desde el gobierno vasco habéis creído en este proyecto desde un inicio y de manera decidida, ¿qué puede aportar este foro desde una visión de país? Bueno, yo, en primer lugar, me gustaría agradecer a la universidad, pero sobre todo agradecer a Itxear la perseverancia y la cabezonería que ha tenido para sacar el foro adelante. Y nos ha costado, porque sí que es cierto que desde el primer momento que, que hablamos del tema, nosotros nos tiramos de cabeza y dijimos el gobierno tiene que estar ahí impulsándolo, porque yo creo que tiene una de las eh, cualidades, y lo estamos viendo aquí, eh, en primer lugar estamos sentados eh, representantes de la administración de todos los niveles. Y yo creo que con los desafíos que tenemos delante, el tener en la cabeza que esto no es posible eh, llevarlo adelante sin una gobernanza multinivel, donde todos los niveles de la Administración estén representados y estemos coordinados trabajando juntos, eh, yo creo que se ve, se ve muy claramente. 
Pero también se ve otra cuestión que es la colaboración público-privada, que yo creo que es una de las señas de identidad de Euskadi, de cómo sacamos las cosas adelante y, y lo sacamos en colaboración, en este caso, con, con la Fundación BBVA. Y yo creo que esa es otra de las características del foro que, que yo creo que son muy significativas. Pero es que estamos en la Fundación Cursos de Verano y estamos hablando de conocimiento, de educación, de ciencia. Y yo creo que eso... En los últimos años, la lucha contra el cambio climático, la lucha por la conservación de la biodiversidad, precisamente lo que ha puesto de relieve es que por primera vez las personas que nos dedicamos a la política, las personas, los agentes sociales, estamos escuchando la ciencia. Y estamos escuchando lo que nos dicen y estamos atendiendo a las recomendaciones que nos dan. Y entonces yo creo que en ese sentido... Como decía, tenemos la lucha contra el cambio climático encima de la mesa, tenemos la lucha por la conservación de la, de la biodiversidad, pero también tenemos unas, unas hojas de ruta. O sea, tenemos en este caso una Agenda Bass Country 2030, estamos hablando de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, está ahí, está ahí para que la implementemos. Y tenemos también un Pacto Verde Europeo que nos está marcando una hoja de ruta a todos los europeos en torno a la digitalización y en torno a la transformación y a la transición energética. Entonces, yo creo que sabemos el problema, sabemos eh, eh, cuáles tienen que ser las estrategias y lo importante es que estemos, como decía, representados toda la parte pública, la parte privada y todos los agentes sociales eh, trabajando en torno a esa estrategia. Y lo tenemos que hacer en tiempos de pandemia, que yo creo que eh, dentro de toda la gravedad que tiene la pandemia lo tenemos que ver precisamente como una palanca de oportunidad en el cual aceleremos esa transición, aceleremos esa lucha contra el cambio climático y salgamos claramente de esta situación con una perspectiva de, de, de transición verde, con una recuperación que sea sostenible, tanto en el aspecto económico como en el aspecto social, como en el, en el aspecto medioambiental. Y yo creo que el foro, precisamente, está configurado con esa, con esa dinámica y desde el Gobierno, lógicamente, eh, tenemos que estar ahí siempre. José Ignacio Asensio, Gipuzkoako Foru Aldundiko Engurumen Diputatuari, Galdetuko Genioke, iraunkortasunaz hitz egiten dugunean, garapenaz, ongi izateaz, sortzen zaigun galdera da, nola egin behar dugu Elena Kaipatzen zuen ekonomia berdea erdiesteko transizioa, eta nola lagundu dezake plataforma honek horretarako. Ekatu, eh? Horretan, horretan, horretan. Bueno, ahora está el gusto y está, bueno, le tengo a usted, eh, no es que es que era que matea, es, eh, bueno, le tengo a usted, está a costa de quinta, pisca de la tela, baño, le gusta a usted, sendo a tela, senda, la está sendo, eh, irán cortas un foro y sango de la, para, en vez de que ahora, es referencia puntual, ¿ves? Eh, pero este tío, bueno, le tengo a usted, le tengo a usted, eh, la gusiena, que está, en el carlana, es algo que está, le tengo, le tengo puntual, también hay patuda, eh, de un arte con el carlana de la, es, va ahí. Administración de instituciones, bueno, no es que se haga la universidad de 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 Eta alen aipatu da baita ere, aukera berriak dira. Eta aukera berriak hoiek, hoiek e, aprobetxatu egin behar ditugu. Badago, eta denok esan e, aipatu dugu baita ere, nola dago er, pakto berdea, e, nola dago green recovery-en e, mundu hori, nola ari garan, eta baita ere Europa mailan, nola ari diran e, bultzatzen horrelako e, ekimenak, eta nola horrelako estrategiak, eta bereziki dirua. Ez? Eta hori ere aprobetxatu egin behar dugu. Hemen, gauden erakunteak hortarako ere en, gaude. Eta gero ya Gipuzko era begira tu kodet. Eh? Eta Gipuzko en badaukagu e, industria sendo bat, eta industria hori transformatu egin bardua. Eta transformatzen ari da. Eta hortarako ere ezagutza, e, ezagutza eta universitatea, eta baita ere agente publiko privatuak hemen aipatu diren bezala, horren elkar lana ezin bestekoa da. Eh? Por tanto, yo creo que eh, se, han, se han tocado todos los temas, ¿no? Eh, los has citado tú, Itziar, al principio. Se han citado aquí que estemos en bueno, pues, las tres administraciones eh, vascas, ¿no? La, la, la local, la supramunicipal y la, y la autonómica. Evidentemente, las demás administraciones serán también necesarias y, para que este camino eh, sea, sea fructífero. Pero es verdad que el que haya una 
tú lo has definido como colaboración público-privada. Si lo ampliamos un poco más, seguramente estamos hablando de alianzas, se ha hablado de objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Es objetivo 17, los, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible que a veces se queda un poco olvidado, pero esas alianzas, esa participación social, esa participación de la sociedad en su conjunto, con el apoyo de las instituciones, con el apoyo del conocimiento y con el apoyo del sector privado económico, los agentes sociales, es fundamental que trabajemos en, en conjunto. Y si hay alguna actividad o si hay un problema que está suscitando cierto consenso, salvo los extremos, e incluso a nivel europeo estamos viendo que las cabezas políticas e institucionales están apostando todos en la misma línea, creo que tenemos, que tenemos que aprovechar esa oportunidad. Este foro va a ser un punto de referencia y yo creo que para los guipuzcoanos, evidentemente, eh, creo que no podemos desaprovechar esta gran oportunidad y agradecer a la Universidad de País Vasco, por supuesto, a la Fundación BBVA y, por supuesto, pues al las otras administraciones y sobre todo a los que bueno, participáis en estos foros, pues este, pues este impulso. ¿no? Y a ti, Chia, particularmente, porque efectivamente la constancia ha sido una de tus virtudes. No sé si te he contestado, pero bueno, creo que... Me, me parece creo que, que sí. por lo menos Luego escucharemos a la ciencia, a, a Javier y a Salman, y creo que nos van a poner en el camino de, de, lo, que hay que, de lo que hay que hacer. ¿no? Es que recasco, Benetan, sí. bioches de Noy. Eta orain, e, gombiratuko ditugu, igotzera, e, Rafael Pardo, BBVA Fundazioko Zuzendaria, eta Nekane Baluerka. Uste dut, e, protokoloa jarraitu behar dugula, eta zuek eseritzen zaretenean, etorriko dira desinfektatzera, beraz, eskatuko dizuet, pazientzia apur bat. Eskarrik asko. Mercedes, eh, por favor, si sois tan amables de acompañarnos aquí en el escenario. Es que recasco. Rafael Pardo, director de la Fundación BBVA y amigo de los cursos de verano, que se ha desplazado en un viaje relámpago desde Madrid en estas circunstancias. Muchas gracias. Eh, a mí me gustaría preguntarte... ¿Cuál es la visión que la Fundación BBVA tiene de este foro de sostenibilidad al que ha dado forma junto con la UPV EHU? Muy buenas tardes. Pues eh, la verdad es que eh, lo esencial de la visión coincide con lo que, con lo que ya se, se acaba de exponer hace unos minutos. Eh, por una parte, dicho así de manera resumida, yo creo que todos estamos convencidos eh, de que esta es la problemática de nuestro tiempo. Esta es, eh, como acaba de decir, solo los que están tres desviaciones típicas a la derecha y a la izquierda, no me refiero del espectro político, sino en fin, de la curva normal, son los que lo niegan, ¿no? o los que se muestran reacios. El, el conjunto de la sociedad, eh, de la sociedad eh, está, eh, ha interiorizado la trascendencia de este reto y a la vez la, la oportunidad. Cuando nosotros comenzamos a hablar de, del foro era la era pre-COVID eh, y, y, y lo que dijimos es la comunidad científica eh, tiene una tradición ya muy sólida de, de contribuciones que está además muy bien representada en el País Vasco, incluso con un centro especial y, y en otros departamentos universitarios. Eh, los medios de comunicación le prestan una atención creciente, las empresas las administraciones eh, públicas, eh, pero también eh, sectores sociales y especialmente la juventud. Dijimos, bueno, estaba ejemplificado en la figura de Greta Thunberg, pero obviamente eh, era un símbolo de que quienes han interiorizado que los impactos de, de no actuar y no actuar decididamente lo van a sufrir especialmente ellos. Dijimos, bueno, esta es, es la ocasión de hacerlo eh, y tratar de, además, hacerlo de una forma que incorpore pues, lo que ya se ha expuesto a agentes públicos y privados, donde la ciencia ocupe eh, un papel esencial, pero también la política. Eh, aquí yo creo que hablamos, vemos que en las encuestas eh, de... Los políticos salen eh, pues, eh, un 2,5, eh, la comunidad científica un 8,7 eh, y realmente yo creo que, que no hemos acabado de trasladar a la sociedad eh, que hay un arte 
que es el arte de, de, formular, de formular y de gestionar eh, preferencias y que hacerlo en sociedades pluralistas, eso es el arte de la política y que sin eso nada ocurre cuando se trata de abordar problemas complejos. Entonces, yo creo que la visión era articular la mejor ciencia, el mejor conocimiento, con el compromiso de las administraciones públicas, que aquí están eh, muy bien eh, y articuladamente representadas, eh, y, ese, y ese fue eh, el arranque, e incorporar a la, a la sociedad. Yo creo que en la etapa esta, eh, del COVID, eh, realmente esa visión eh, que, que formulamos en conversaciones variadas, pues quizás no ha hecho sino ganar importancia. El Club de Roma, lo comentaba hace unos minutos, hace muchos años, habló del aprendizaje por shock, ¿no? cuando tienes un choque sistémico de la naturaleza que hemos, que hemos vivido y que estamos viviendo, todas las sociedades, pues eh, muchas cosas se, de la noche a la mañana se aprenden, todos hemos aprendido eh, la curva, aplanar la curva, hemos, dis, distinguimos virus de bacterias, pero más allá de eso hemos aprendido a teletrabajar, hemos aprendido a ser más flexibles eh, y estar dispuestos a calibrar las cosas vía ensayo-error, no pidiendo que haya una solución única de una sola vez, sino que se vayan, se vayan graduando. Yo creo que esta, deberíamos aprender dos cosas más eh, eh, respecto a lo que hablamos. Uno, que quizás lo traten en el diálogo siguiente, el profesor Jordano y, el, y nuestro primer premiado de comunicación medioambiental, el principal periodista de la BBC, eh, Matt Graf, eh, que van a tener el diálogo siguiente, eh, que es eso que, que se llama la zoonosis, de lo que hablamos muy poco, la transmisión de virus de, del mundo animal eh, pues a humanos eh, por prácticas inadecuadas y por destrucción de la biodiversidad, mercados calientes, etc. Yo creo que esa es una conexión eh, eh, nueva, eh, vista la pandemia, eh, no habíamos vivido nada así, eh, no, fruto de, o, o guerras, o, o disrupciones económicas, pero esto es otra disrupción sistémica que ha afectado a todo. Pero más allá de eso, yo creo que deberíamos aprender en que si hemos tenido, y todavía no sabemos bien cómo gestionarlo, eh, un impacto sistémico tan importante, fruto de, de esa transmisión de, de virus, eh, que es la pandemia, el cambio climático, si, si seguimos superando los, los tipping points que la comunidad científica nos lleva advirtiendo eh, que se están eh, superando uno tras otro, el problema es que no eh, se podrá mirar a, a ver si dentro de un año o seis meses hay una vacuna o dos vacunas, sino que tendríamos que esperar en el mejor de los escenarios décadas, ¿no? eh, décadas para poder revertir eh, los efectos. Y, lo, y, y cuando hay estos impactos sistémicos, pues realmente es muy difícil eh, gestionarlos. Creo que, que la pandemia eh, pone de manifiesto con perdón, es un ensayo dramático eh, de lo que puede ocurrir si una sociedad eh, o un conjunto de sociedades no atienden a la información que llega de la ciencia eh, y se toman las medidas eh, con decisión en, en un conjunto de planos. Bueno, yo creo que eh, esa, esa es la visión. Aquí tenemos eh, pues una institución muy potente, que es la Universidad del País Vasco, con los cursos de verano como la avanzadilla de capturar conocimiento, de que, no solo del que se expresa en papers, sino del que está en las empresas, el que está en, en, en la administración, en la cabeza de, de los políticos, en los medios de comunicación y en el público general, eh, y creo que tenemos pues, todos los componentes para que, como ya se, se ha dicho hace unos minutos, pues esto sea una auténtica referencia, eh, pero no solo porque referencia como marca, sino porque contribuya a lo que creo que a todos los que estamos aquí pues nos, eh, nos reúne eh, y, nos, eh, y, y con lo que estamos comprometidos. ¿no? Son los objetivos del foro. Es que recasco. Eta orain, eh... Eh, inaugurazio honekin amaitzeko Nekane Baiorka, EHUko errektore eta Udai Kastaroetako patronatuaren presidentari emango diot itza. Nekane, zergatik eta zertarako sortu dugu iraunkortasun foroa UPV EHUko Udai Kastaroen baitan? 
Bueno, nik eh, uste dut eh, foro hau guztiz txertatzen dela Uda Ikastaroen dinamikan, zen Uda Ikastaroek baldin badaukate balio erantsi bat da gaurkotasuna, gaurkotasuna eta dinamismoa. Beraz, benetan gizarteari kezkatzen dioten gaiei buruz eztabaidatzen du eta oso dinamikoa ez dira eztabaida guztiorik. Eta gainera edo zein arlotan izan daiteke kulturala, zientifikoa, ekonomikoa, politikoa Eta zein gai izan da, zein gai da, gure ustez, ba, nagusienetariko bat eta kezkatu behar gaituen bat, ba, iraunkortasuna, jasangarritasuna. Izan ere, ba, hemen esan den bezala, gure planetaren e, balia bideak finituak dira, mugatuak dira, zaindu behar ditugu, eta horren inguruan, hausunarketa personal eta kolektibo bat egin behar dugu, eta gure eredu sozioekonomikoaren inguruan ere, hausunarketa sendo bat egin behar dugu, eta hori Euskal Herriko Unibertsitatetik, ba, zerbitzu publikoa den neurrian, egiten da, jadanik e, ODS, amazazpi ODS inguruan, amabiekin oso komprometituak, oietako amabiekin oso komprometituak gaude, baita ere kultura arteko aniztasunarekin ere bai, eta nik uste dut foro honetan, ardatz hori, ba, guztiz lantzen dela, eta horregatik, ba, ezagut ezagutza sortzeko eta ezagutza gizarteratzeko ba, eredu ezinho be bat da. Eta gainera nik pentsatzen dut ere referente bihurtu daiteke lan nazio arte mailan, ba, hemen esan den moduan, ez? Bueno, decía brevemente que creo que la naturaleza del foro entronca directamente con, con la dinámica y con la actualidad de los cursos de verano, que es yo creo que un valor añadido, Incluso por encima de lo que son las enseñanzas oficiales, que tienen un nivel de estabilidad mayor, evidentemente cambian a medida que los conocimientos van avanzando, pero los cursos de verano nos permiten un acercamiento a la sociedad mucho más dinámico y, y mucho más divulgativo. Y por lo tanto creo que, que este foro, que aborda para mí uno de los temas y de los problemas de nuestra generación y de la generación futura más importantes, como es el cambio climático, como es la sostenibilidad, pues creo que ocupa un espacio que realmente era necesario y yo estoy muy agradecida a todas las instituciones que nos han apoyado en este, en este camino y creo que se puede convertir en referente también a nivel internacional por la calidad de todas las acciones que se van a llevar a cabo y de los ponentes que hoy desde luego vamos a, a ver, que son dos ponentes de primerísimo nivel y por lo tanto creo que va a ser una apuesta de largo excelente para, para este foro. Esquerre Casco, muchísimas gracias. Gracias a todas las instituciones por el apoyo y la confianza que habéis depositado en nosotros y hacemos nuestros los objetivos que habéis formulado y esperamos que entre todos los consigamos. Es que recasco, Veneta. Eta orain, eh, gure lehen jarduerari emango diogu así era. Irek, irekieraren eh, unea heldu da, Eta urrengo asteetan horrelako jarduera ireki hainbat izango ditugu aste guztietan irailean zehar non e, plataforma ikusi izango dituzuen eta baita ere gero e, nahi duenak ba berriz ere deskargatu eta ikusi. Entre las actividades abiertas que ofrecemos en la plataforma del foro se han programado una serie de conferencias y entrevistas que inauguramos hoy con la conversación entre Salman Khan y Javier Aizpurua que podréis después eh, volver a, a visualizar en la plataforma y también los que nos veis desde casa. Hoy, como decía, contamos con Salman Khan, que se conecta desde California, al que presentará Javier Aizpurua. Eh, antes de dar paso al, al propio Javier Aizpurua para que, para, que haya, para que presente a Salman Khan y dé comienzo al diálogo, me gustaría agradecer que haya accedido a nuestra petición. Buscábamos una persona preocupada por la docencia, una persona que fuera buena comunicadora, entusiasta y que además conociera los cursos de verano por dentro. Eh, esa persona, evidentemente, era Javier Izpurua y por eso está hoy aquí. Estamos profundamente agradecidos por eh, su enorme disposición a ayudar a este foro y a los cursos de verano. Es que ricasco, Javier. Javier Izpurua es uh, Research Professor at the University of the Basque Country and the Spanish National Research Council. He is the leader of the Theory of Nanophotonics Group at the Material Physics Center and He is also a member of the Board of Trustees at these summer courses. Es que ricasco, Javier Naidusunean. Creo que 
Creo que tenemos que hacer un pequeño cambio en el escenario. Yo me voy a bajar. Mot Caixo, Arratxaldeon, Danoi, Mila Esquer, esan diate, bakarikan nagones posible duela maskarillak entzia eta zehar dugura izaiten. Ez bakarrik alde bat edi, baina bi aldetatik. Bueno, ba, Mila Esquer itziar zuen hitz goxuen gatik eta benetan etzako horian eria da, hemen eoteatik eta eskertzen ditut zuri, gure rektorea hi eta eta fundatzaila eta danoi gombidapen honen gatik, ez? Hasiko naz, agian ingelesea pasatzen. Our conversation today, it's, as I said, a privilege for me to be here, to be invited. I'm honored to be here to talk to Salman Khan today, and I'm going to start the conversation. Mainly greeting Mr. Khan, which I can see now in our screen. Can you hear me, Mr. Khan? Yes, yes, good to be here. Excellent. I'm Javier Aispurua, a researcher at the University of the Basque Country and a teacher. And I'm privileged and it will be an honor to me, for me to, to share the conversation with you today. Uh, welcome to our forum, our platform on sustainability. And thank you very much for accepting to be with us today. No, glad to be here, at least virtually. Excellent. Well, I think everybody knows uh, Salman Khan and who Salman Khan is, right? And, and his role in, in global education, his role and the role of his academy, right? Uh, Salman Khan is a graduate in mathematics and engineer, uh, also graduate in, in information technology, and, and he founded, like 12 years ago, uh, uh, a non-profit organization who has made accessible uh, videos, exercises, teaching platform for free worldwide with 60 million users who can access to all these contents for free, as I say. And this has put him in the hottest spot of global education worldwide. Uh, this is one of the reasons why he's here. But on top of that, his views, his uh, visions on education and global education made him a perfect person to interact with and to do some brainstorming on sustainability and the role of education and sustainability. So uh, we know all that. We, we know the amazing role you're playing in global education, but I would like to ask you to start how you see yourself. Who is Salman Khan nowadays? Uh, what is the philosophy of Salman Khan as a person, the Khan Academy as a, as a foundation, and how is it compared to 12 years ago when you started? Yeah, I, I've actually never had that question. That's a very deep question. Who is Salman Khan? Absolutely. Give it, Absolutely. Give it we start justice. strong here. But, um, you know, as, as you just uh, generously introduced, uh, you know, Khan Academy itself, we're not-for-profit, mission-free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And there's always been three pillars to that vision. Uh, one has been, can we create learning materials, uh, uh, exercises, videos, articles, uh, for students from as early as pre-kindergarten all the way through elementary, middle, high school, and early college. Uh, the second pillar is, if we're going to be doing it, can we do it in the optimally engaging way? Can we make it personalized? Uh, one thing we talk a lot about is that in a traditional system, students have to move all together. They have to move lockstep. And if 
uh, you get 90% on a test and I get 70% on a test, even though that test has identified gaps, in a traditional system, the whole class moves on to the next concept. And it's probably a concept that is going to build on your gaps. And what we see over and over in a traditional system is that as kids keep moving forward with a 10% gap here, a 20% gap there, that eventually they'll hit a wall. It often happens in an algebra class or a physics class. And it's not because of algebra. It's not because of the student's ability. It's because the equation involves dividing a decimal, which the student didn't fully learn in fifth grade, or involves multiplying negative numbers, which they didn't fully learn in seventh grade. So our second pillar is, if we're able to deliver world-class education content, practice, videos, exercises, can we also do it in a way that personalizes to the needs of the student and is in engaging as possible for the student? And then the last pillar, and this is something we're just starting to think very seriously about, is how do we connect learning that can happen anywhere in the world uh, to real opportunities, to jobs, apprenticeships, uh, higher education? So we, we've been on that journey for a long time. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, if you... It, 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 this all started with me tutoring some family members, and, and one thing led to another. Uh, and by you know about 12 years ago, I set it up as a, a not-for-profit organization. You fast forward to today, uh, we're a little, we're I think we're 110 million registered users around the the world, 46 languages to various degrees, and I would say we're about 60 percent along that mission. Uh, in math, we're very well built out. Uh, we have a lot of high school science content. Uh, in English, we have something called Khan Academy Kids. I hope to ha make that available in other languages over the next few years, which is uh, for pre-K and, and it's reading, writing, social, emotional learning. Uh, but, you know, I, I think our goal is to just keep building this out. I, I want to create a world that, you know, within our lifetimes, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, people will take it for granted that there's always access to a lifeline of education. And, you know, one thing I always make clear is we don't view what we're doing as competitive with the traditional education system. We view it as complementary. I'll be the first to say that if I had to pick between in-person education for my kids with an amazing teacher and technology, I would pick the in-person education every time. Uh, but the ideal is if you can put these together so that the technology uh, can allow people to learn at their own pace, give the teachers more information, uh, and then allow the class time to be more interactive. Yeah, so, so it's a bunch of uh, pillars, well, three pillars and a lot of collateral implications of, of these pillars, which made uh, your concept and the Academy very success in global education, right? I, from what I read and from what you say, I, I understand that there is a lot of, or it's very important, uh, the quality of the content themselves, right? So it's not, uh, not any content works, right? Part of the success is the, ri the rigor and the rigorosity of the contents you put online that people really learn and learn well, right? So it's, it's not only that, but that's important as well, right? It's not just the methodology of having the content and working later and, uh, at home, but the content itself and the rigor of the content is important, right? To do things, but to do them well. I, I, absolutely. You know, it, on some level, I think it was a blessing that Khan Academy started off as a family project back in 2004. Uh, because what I saw, you know, I had one cousin who needed help in tutoring, uh, I tutored her and it, was, it really helped her and then word spread in my family that free tutoring was happening. And so I found myself uh, with 10 or 15 cousins. Yeah. And I, I saw a common pattern over and over again. I saw that they had these gaps in their knowledge uh, that you know, once you're in ninth grade, it's very hard to fill that gap from fifth grade or from sixth grade. And I also saw that the way that they were approaching learning, especially in math and science, but really in all subjects is they were memorizing formulas uh, they didn't really see how everything fit together. Uh, frankly, they weren't seeing the beauty in the content. They weren't seeing how exciting a lot of, you know, I would argue everything that you learn in school, if you view it in the right way, can be incredibly exciting. You know, it's the, it's the culmination of someone's life work <laughs> of research. And, you know, Isaac Newton would have done anything to have access to your current uh, math textbook or, or science textbook. And, and so uh, what I, when I was making that first content for my cousins, and the first thing I did is create write some software for them so that they can get as much practice as they need and fill in those gaps. Uh, but then I made the videos, and actually wasn't my idea. It was a friend suggested that I make videos uh, for my cousins on YouTube, and I immediately thought it was a horrible idea. I said, no, YouTube is for cats playing piano. It's for dogs on skateboards. It is not for <laughs> learning math. Uh, but when I went home, got over the idea that it was not my idea, I gave it a shot. And it was a blessing that those videos, you know, it was just me for my cousin. So it was very... I would say 
um, personal. It was very extemporaneous. You know, you can still see those videos. They were uploaded in 2006. Uh, where, and, and Khan Academy videos are still like this. You just see the screen and you hear uh, often me talking, uh, explaining things. And what I really wanted even in those first videos is, and those first videos had very low production quality, uh, but what they were conveying is a, a passion for the area, uh, an intuition for it, uh, you know, so not only rigorous in terms of, you know, the rigorous material, but also not just memorizing a formula or memorizing some type of process, but really understanding what it means and how it connects to other things. And I saw that the more that I did that for my family, and, you know, it was fun because it was just a family project. So, I would, you know, I would just, I was very comfortable. I, I would talk, I do talk on the videos the way I'm talking now, just like a normal sure. human being. And uh, I think that really resonated for my cousins. They famously told me that they like me better on YouTube than in person. Uh, so I took that as positive <laughs> feedback. And so I, uh, and then it was clear that other people uh, on the internet, and you know, when they said they like me better on YouTube than in person, my understanding of that, they really appreciated me calling them up, having me in their life. So that role was very important. But when you're trying to learn something, it's also very valuable to have an infinitely patient cousin who can, you can pause, you can repeat, if you're in ninth grade, you don't have to be embarrassed that you're reviewing some of your arithmetic from fourth or fifth grade. And so I think that's what they were really appreciating. Sure, sure. No, that's very interesting, actually, that they like better, the, well, not better, but it worked better somehow, the video that the actual in-person interaction, right? But now, even here uh, in the Basque Country, in Europe, all over the world, uh, we are having this uh, tremendous situation of the pandemic, uh, a kind of uh, special situation worldwide where your tools, the kind of education uh, you propose or you allow uh, was kind of premonitory, right? Or was particularly well suited for this kind of situation. And, and however, even if uh, the kind of tools that an academy like the Khan Academy uh, provides to people is fantastic, it allows to get online, get your concepts, get your contents, uh, be well educated, but a lot of people, there's a strong debate in society, in our university, we miss the in-person interaction, right? We miss, as a teacher, I, I miss the, the in-person interaction with my students to see where they fail. Of course, we can do the statistics of the exercises, but now everybody's willing, looking forward to coming back to, to in-person contact. And it sounds like paradoxical, but when we have the best tools and we have improved and optimized these tools, we really we don't want to get rid of them. Of course, we want to keep them and improve them, but we really miss the in-person interaction, right? So, what uh, what would be best to leave for online and remote uh, education and teaching, and what would be better to leave for in-person, or, or how to integrate them? What is your vision on that? Yeah, and, and I think this is a central question right now, and we're having is extremely healthy and it's a, it's a conversation frankly we, we should have had even pre-COVID because uh, you're absolutely right uh, an in-person experience you, you know we talk about school as a place where you can learn certain academic standards but we all know that's only a part of school there's a very big part of school of forming friendships working in groups being part of a community being mentored by incredible teachers and you know in higher education we were I, I, I used to say this a lot you know well before COVID that is the value. And so, you know, when you go to a university, um, to be in a lecture hall with 300 students and just to passively listen, no. that's not a particularly engaging experience. So I think coming out of this, uh, you know, when, once things normalize, online could be used for students to get practice at their own time and pace. I would argue online is better than most textbooks. It's far more interactive, far more uh, different modalities where you can learn and get practice and get feedback. And, you, and it gives data to your instructor. Uh, online is a great place to get the explanations and because it can be on demand when you need it. It can be done in kind of bite-sized pieces. And that way, when you get into a classroom with a professor and with your peers, that should all be about interaction. Uh, that should not be about one person at the front lecturing to everyone else. I say, if someone is talking for more than four or five minutes straight, that should be a video. So I'm going to be very careful today. I'm not going to try to <laughs> talk for more than that. Uh, but, any, any, uh, but ideally, when people are together, they should be interacting. So it could be you know, simulation, Socratic dialogue, professor giving a problem and saying, OK, go into groups, work on it, and now come back. Let's think about everyone's solution. 
And not only do I think that will lead to better learning, more engaged learning, uh, but it's going to lead to more human, hu human to human interaction, which I think I completely agree. Uh, it's, you're, it's, ne it's not online, distance learning is never going to be close to that. You know, we're in a situation now with COVID, depending on where you are in the world, where we often don't have that option right now, probably for the next six months or for the next year. And so even there, uh, where a Khan Academy could be used for students to get practice, feedback, get micro lessons, when students get together, and you know, these days it's on Zoom or on video conference of some kind, even that should be as interactive as possible. Uh, it should not be the teacher just lecturing to the students. They should be calling on students, asking them questions, putting them into virtual breakouts, asking them to uh, answer each other's questions. And you know, the, 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 the distance learning gives you new tools, new flexibility. You know, traditionally, in, in K-12, we have one-hour classes. And in higher education, maybe an hour, maybe 90-minute classes. And I've done a lot of research into why they are that long. And uh, the best thing I could find is, uh, logistically, that's about how long you can keep people in a class. You know, there's some switching costs in the physical world when you have to switch classes. And so you try to keep them as long as you can. But, you know, after an hour, hour and a half, people have to, you know, <laughs> biology calls or something or their attention span. But in, in, in this um, virtual framework, you can be more flexible. So, you know, simple answer, I don't view distance learning as a replacement for physical. But I think it makes us ask exactly the questions you asked, which is, what is distance learning good at? And then what should we really optimize in the physical to make it even more human, even more interactive? Yeah. Actually, around these concepts, uh, a few years ago, you, you somehow pass from or, or, or kind of develop yourselves from just only distance uh, and remote learning to, to in-person remote with this uh, new school that you founded in person, a school in California. How, how is it working? I mean, how are, are you able to, to, to implement this kind of integration nicely and uh, how is it working? Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, in 2012, I wrote a book, One World Schoolhouse. And in that book, the first third was uh, the history of education. You know, how did we get where we are now? The second third was, how did I get here? How did I end up, you know, falling into this Khan Academy project? And then the last third of the book was really thinking from first principles. What could education look like, given what the world now needs and given the tools at our disposal? And some of these were related to everything we've been talking about. You know, students should be able to learn at their own time and pace. They should get multiple chances to master things. Uh, what's variable should be the pace and what's fixed should be that everyone learns it at a very high standard. Uh, uh, but some of the tools are, are things that are, are some of the ideas have nothing to really to do with technology. Ideas of, you know, can we leverage students to tutor each other more uh, so you get more personalization? Uh, can you do full day, full year learning? You know, our modern school system is based on people having to work on a farm. Obviously, we're not an agrarian civilization anymore. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it questioned all of these things, but it's one thing to write about it theoretically. It's a whole other thing to actually put no. it in practice. So in 2014, uh, I set up a, a laboratory school in our offices uh, to test these ideas. And the idea isn't just to start another school, although it is another school. Uh, it is to uh, put these ideas into practice and hopefully see which of them work or how we can make them work and eventually share with others. Uh, today, you know, six years later, it's a K through 12 school with 200 students. Uh, all three of my kids go there. My kids are 11, 9, and 5. Uh, and I think, you know, in some of those ideas, the school has made a lot of progress. I think in other areas, uh, the school needs more progress. And I think, you know, the places that have been really successful have been students learning at their own pace, students taking more ownership over their own learning. You know, when the COVID school closures happened, uh, the students really didn't miss a beat because they were already to some degree used to uh, being self-directed and the teachers were used to not lecturing but being the guides being the mentors for the sure. students and so when they had to transition to distance learning being doing being able to do that type of interaction over zoom uh, was very natural for all of them yeah. i think the school could go f and the school does a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning but i think the school could go even further in that direction so uh you know what i find what i found over the last six years is all of us adults uh we we tend to say oh those are kids let's you know, we have to watch them more, we have to do more for them. 
And it is true. As soon as you let the kids take a little bit, the first few weeks are messy. And that's usually the time that us adults jump back in. It's like, okay, that wasn't a good idea. We gave the kid too much freedom. We let the kids have too much responsibility. Uh, but what we find is if you have a little bit of faith and you keep giving those kids those responsibilities and you hold them accountable for it, after those first few weeks, you'd be amazed how much even an eight or a nine-year-old is willing to step up, not just for themselves, but for their peers. Yeah. In my work, uh, but we are talking also about averages, right? The, the average student might be, uh, well, encouraging for learning more and have responsibility, but there are always people on the sides, right? On, on the top and the worst, and they don't find an engagement for continuing, or some people are bored because they know too much. So how does it work, this kind of global tools for people who are in the extremes of for good or for bad? How, how do you see to, to give response to those extremes of good and bad? Or yeah, more than no, good and bad, is... more saying people who are on the top and people who take more time to get it? Yeah, well, you know, I think this is a central question and this is a central motivation for personalization. Every teacher will tell you that when they have a class of 30 students, it's exactly what you describe. There's two or three students who are bored. They could go probably a grade level or two ahead. There's uh, two or three students who are really struggling, maybe more students who are really struggling. And uh, you know, there's been research done on this that the average teacher teaches to the 22nd percentile. And so that means that roughly 78% of kids are bored and roughly, actually, 21% of kids are lost. <laughs> only, only if you're sitting at the 22nd yeah. percentile are you really getting uh, engaged. And so, uh, you know, the notion of personalization is don't do that. Let every student work at their, mm -hmm. you know, zone of proximal development, at their learning edge, uh, so that what they're working on is optimal. Now, for the kids who are maybe a little bit slower initially, and once again, you know, in our, in our system, we equate slower with dumber. And I've seen over and over again, those two things are not necessarily the same thing, mm -hmm. even though our, our system oftentimes says it, because sometimes the student who's taking more time is trying to learn things more deeply, trying to connect them to other things, uh, trying to you know, really master the subject. Uh, and what we see over and over again, and I've seen this in data in multiple classrooms, is a lot of those students that need a little bit more time on one concept, if they're allowed to build that strong foundation, then they race ahead on the next few concepts. And the other way around is true. Some of the kids who race through one concept, uh, if they don't really build a strong intuition for it, then they might slow down when they hit another, uh, another subject. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the main idea is if we can personalize and reach every student where they are, that's ideal. Now, if, I was, if we were talking 50 years ago, uh, this would have been very hard for one teacher by themselves, you, you know, to be able to have every 30, all 30 students working on different things, giving them different assessments, keeping track of what they were doing. But that's where technology can be valuable. We can give the tools where every student can learn at their, at their level, uh, where the teacher can monitor. And the teacher can, you know, sometimes the student just isn't engaged for things that have nothing to do with the academics. The teacher can sit down to them, do a very personal interaction. Maybe there's five kids who are having trouble with another thing. And what we find is that 10 minutes of a more personal interaction is far more powerful than 60 minutes or a week of an impersonal interaction. Uh, so Absolutely. you know, that, that in my mind is the best way to address. And you know, I get letters every day from people who thought they were, they thought they were slow or they thought they were you know, no. dumb. And um, when they were allowed to learn at their own time and pace, and some of these people are adults now, they realize that, that they love mathematics or science or whatever the subject is. And, you know, I've gotten letters from people who said, you know, I then, I was originally a high school dropout. Now I'm a physics major in college. And so, you know, they're going from that side all the way to that side. So I'm more and more convinced as I've gone on this journey uh, that those labels between the fast and the slow you know, are, are actually temporary, should be temporary yeah. labels. Uh, but our system oftentimes makes them permanent labels. And that's precisely your philosophy, right? To try to adapt the context to each student space, right? So, well, I, I think all, all, all the things you are saying are very interesting globally for education as a whole. But here we are in a, in a forum or in a platform who is going to analyze, which is going to analyze sustainability, right? And uh, we all know that now the, the United Nations approve uh, education inclusive, uh, equitable and of quality education as uh, one of the objectives, the goals of sustainable development, right? So we all identify uh, education as a pillar of sustainability, of a sustainable world, of a sustainable humankind, right? So it seems to me like 
education, which seemed to be like a tool, like a means uh, to, to reach sustainable thinking, sustainable development, has become a goal itself, right? So it's like the path or the way, as the Tibetan saying was saying, is the goal itself, right? So what is the role of education and uh, as a path, as a way, and as a goal itself for a sustainable world, for, for a sustainable development in a platform like that, uh, we think that everything starts with education, and education will be enabling. Of course, I think you also think so. What is your vision on this education for sustainability and sustainable education? Yeah, I, you know, I couldn't agree more uh, that, you know, when you look at almost any other issue, if you look at, uh, you know, poverty, if you look at women's rights or, uh, you know, equitable opportunity in a society, uh, when you really double click on any of those, it really becomes a matter of education. And so, uh, you know, in, in my view, we, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, if we were having this conversation, it would have seemed utopian to say that, you know, I think even then people would have agreed that you know, giving everyone access to a world-class education could really help level the playing field, give more people more opportunity, allow people to participate, make better decisions in a democracy, you know, not, not be as susceptible to, you know, uh, the, you, 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 you know uh, misinformation mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we're, we're oftentimes seeing these days, uh, and just happier, more productive folks, you know, even in things like how they run their families, et cetera, manage their finances. But now we do have an opportunity. You know, we have modalities where, once again, you know, everything we've talked about is ideally technology is used in conjunction with an amazing physical environment. But we know that there's many parts of the world where they either where students or adult learners don't have access to school or the school that they have access to isn't so good. And so I'm excited about the opportunity over the next decade or so, and, and, and hopefully Khan Academy is a big part of this, to create a reality where anyone on the planet, if at least you know they have access to a to a smartphone, and, and hopefully these are getting you know cheaper every day, uh, and and some basic internet connection, that they can tap into their potential. They can you know wherever they need to start, they can learn at their own time and pace across subjects and grades, and then prove what they know. And that proof, you know, a lot of what we talk about is we should move to a global competency-based learning uh, system. You know, right now uh, you could go to the school. You know, there's Few of us are lucky to go to some famous schools that if you go anywhere in the world, people know it. But most people don't have that opportunity. Most people, even if they are able to go to a high school or a college uh, and they get a diploma, if they go into a neighboring region or a neighboring country or they go on the other side of the world, people don't understand what the, you know, what, what's the standard of that diploma. And so I think there's an opportunity, uh, and, I'm, and we're working on some few projects to do this, is can we create a global way uh, to get credentials that aren't dependent on how you learn the material, but just dependent on whether you can do it or not. Uh, so that's what competency-based learning is. You know, the opposite of competency-based learning is seat time learning, where you just say, oh, you sat in a chair for an hour, we'll give you credit for that class. It should be the other way around. It doesn't matter whether you sat for a week or whether you sat for three years in the chair, do you know the material or not? If you know the material, we'll give you credit. And if that credit should be recognized everywhere in the world. Uh, so. I'm hoping that we can uh, help architect that. And, you know, I think even, you know, you ask about higher education. You know, higher education was originally created for the elite, and then it became an aspirational thing. And, uh, you know, now it's become kind of a gateway to a middle-class life, a, a white-collar life. Uh, but the reality is, you know, our higher education system, I think there's a lot in it that might not, you know, might not be necessary for everyone. Uh, you know, I, I joke that, Clearly, when they designed the higher education system, you know, in the U.S., an undergraduate degree is a four-year degree, uh, regardless of whether you're majoring in computer science or art history or psychology. So, so clearly, someone said, we have four years, let's fill it up. <laughs> they didn't say, you know, what does it take to become a great computer scientist or what does it take to be a great art historian? Because the odds that they all take exactly eight semesters, <laughs> exactly four years, <laughs> is, 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 are very low. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to, de to unpack these things and give people the opportunity to learn what, really, what they really need to know. And you know, I'm not saying that you only have to focus on what you need for a job. There's other things that you can learn. You should give people more agency and more optionality. 
And it shouldn't just be bound to those few years. Uh, in theory, you could do a little bit in your you know, teens, early 20s and work, but then come back or do some of it while you're still um, employed it is, I think, what's going to happen over the next decade or so. Yeah, I think I, I completely share this view because sometimes uh, people work around the idea of the degree, right, rather than what they know, really, and what they can do, right. as you say. Uh, but this would require kind of partitioning or, or splitting the, the, the teaching process from the credentials themselves, right? And that would be very provocative for the status quo of the high university system, I, I would say. But it's a very interesting concept. I think a little bit utopia, but, uh, but I think it's interesting to, to try to separate what we teach and how we credential what uh, people really know how, what to do, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it. I, I, I think, you know, look, I, I don't think it's going to replace your traditional credentialing system, but I think you're already seeing pockets where a student might, let's say, major in computer science from a famous university, but they still are doing other, I would say, competency-based things so they can send a very strong signal to say, no, I'm, I'm ready to be hired as a software engineer. You're seeing a lot of employers, even when someone has a a very good grade point average from a great university with a great diploma, employers are increasingly skeptical of like, do they really know what I need them to know? And oftentimes employers then have to retrain them uh, when they come on the job. So I think in a world where I don't think higher education diploma is going to go away, I think you're going to have parallel paths or you're also going to have supplementary paths where even if someone does go to higher education, they're also going to want these things. And then there's other people who might say, you know, I have other constraints in my life where I'm going to go straight to these, these global credentials. I think they're going to exist in some way, shape, or form in certain industries in the next 10 years. We have a couple of projects, maybe by next year, but I would say in the next 10 years, they'll be mainstream, my, my prediction. Yeah. So, so actually, I mean, considering that education is so important for, for sustainability and, and for developing a, a sustainable society, how do you see the, the fact that your academy, for example, even if you are open into history and, and economy, but it, it, it was coming from a very technical set of content, right? Mathematics and, and computing science and physics. And how can we transfer or how can we make the transition from a simple transfer of knowledge and content, many of them technical, to an attitude and a behavior towards sustainability equitable society, inclusive. Uh, there is a kind of, I see a kind of transition needed here, which uh, maybe just with the tool of a video itself, with the content is not enough, right? How we feel in the education system, teachers, the students themselves, the, the platform, how we enable this uh, transition towards a sustainable, uh, or education with sustainable values. Yeah, I think it's a, 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 a very important question. I think there's some that can happen implicitly, even if you are doing hard, you know, math, science, because, you know, part of a more sustainable, equitable future is just people building strong critical thinking skills. And obviously that can happen that way. Uh, but, you know, at our school that we were talking about, there's a lot of focus on, you know, students to teaching students isn't just about academic standards. That's how you build empathy. That's how you build collaboration. You know, in our school, in person school, because so much of the, I would say, the traditional academic standards, especially, you know, the technical skills in math or science can be handled at a student's own time and pace. It frees up time in the classroom to focus a lot more on what you just described. Uh, but there's some projects that we're working on that we're even trying to figure out, can we scale this and even do this in a virtual? Once again, I think the physical environment is always going to be better, but a lot of folks don't have a very rich physical environment. So there's another project that actually I just started on. Really, I've always wanted to do it, but COVID was the stimulus to say, we have to start doing it. It's actually a project outside of Khan Academy. One day, I hope it'll come back and become part of Khan Academy, but it's called schoolhouse.world. And what this is, it's, it's doing two things. Uh, on one level, it's a place where any student can go, and it just started about a month ago. Uh, there's only about a few thousand kids okay. in it right now, but I'm hoping it'll be a few hundred thousand or a few million uh, over the next year. But students can come and ask for help. And it's still in these technical subjects you're talking about. It's in math and science. We're going to expand to others. And that volunteer tutors from around the world can show up and schedule group tutoring sessions for these students. So these are free tutoring sessions. So one, it gives that in-person experience, ability for students to ask questions, uh, become part of a community, which is really important right now. But then the other part of schoolhouse.world is a little bit of credentialing. So uh, we are creating a process where if students want to prove what they know, they can do the, the uh, uh, 
an adaptive test on Khan Academy while they video themselves uh, and talk out loud. And then other members of the community who have already achieved mastery in that subject will review the, rev the video and validate whether the students know the material. That's the level one. But once you're level one, in order to get the higher credentials, you have to be a highly rated tutor. And uh, by being a highly rated tutor, there's two things that happen. Obviously, when you teach a subject, you know this, you're a professor. When you teach the subject, you have to know this far deeper uh, than you know, just being able to take an assessment. And that's very hard to fake. Uh, you, can't, you can't cheat <laughs> to become a good tutor. But even more, that makes you worry about other people. It makes you invest in other people's growth. It makes you build your communication, your empathy skills, which you know, traditionally aren't really being built in a, in a math class. And then you can imagine this peer-to-peer -peer tutoring and peer-to-peer -peer assessment. This could eventually be extended to any subject. Uh, you know, in, in graduate, oral examination has always been the gold standard. It happens in PhD defenses. Uh, uh, what if we could do oral examination for most subjects, where not only do we evaluate whether you have the technical skills, but we can evaluate your communication, we can evaluate your collaboration, um, how much you've empathized, how much you've helped other folks. And, you know, the only way to scalably do that is to be doing some type of really thoughtful peer-to-peer -peer, uh, model. So uh, we're already starting to experiment on that. Uh, and I am hoping that, you know, over the next a few years, we're able to give signals not just of, you know, whether a student knows how to factor a polynomial or, you know, can do accounting or, or statistics, uh, but also, you know, their communication, their empathy, their collaboration. Yeah. No, I think that's very important because on top of the contents, uh, all you're mentioning has to be worked out, right? The peer-to-peer -peer interaction, the set uh, uh, a model of values to, to, to follow, or not to follow, but to, to be inspired by, and then follow your own path, right? I, I heard you in, in, in many different platforms to, to talk about the empowerment, right? Uh, the empowerment of both the teachers and the students themselves, your tools uh, as, as an empowerment of the, of the teacher and, and also the students. What are supposed to do the students and the teachers with that empowerment that you're videos and your pills provide to them. What can they do without the interaction? We are facing now pandemic uh, situation, confinement, and we are at our homes. We cannot interact peer-to-peer -peer so well, except for certain uh, connections, uh, video and online. I feel empowered by your contents as a teacher. I feel that my students feel that they can feel also empowered. What we do with that? I mean, what does this empowerment uh, help for? or how we channel it, or how we develop it. Yeah, you know, you know on the student level, whether pre-COVID or even now, you know, the main empowerment is uh, any student can go and start learning exactly at their level. They get as much practice, as much feedback, as much support. You know, when you and I were, were kids, if we wanted to learn out of curiosity, we would have to go, you know, find a library, find a textbook, sure. um, and then somehow, you know, get good at reading a textbook, you know, and I remember, I think those of us who have done well in school, uh, we built that muscle of being able to read fairly dense library, textbooks, yeah. which are, which are not, you know, optimally engaging, uh, you know, Khan Academy existence in the world, I think m lowers the threshold dramatically for how easy it is to take ownership of your own learning. Uh, you can get it at your own time, your own pace. It's on a cell phone. You could be sitting on a bus. You could be on vacation with your family and you can learn. So now for kids, you know, the question really isn't, do you have access? I mean, for some, we still have to worry about internet access and all that. But, you know, for most middle income families, especially, and even some lower middle income families, the question really is just motivation for students. So I think that's the first message. You know, I, would, I tell every young person, the tools at your disposal, and it's not just Khan Academy, there's many other things. You, the world is just there. It's a, it's a click away, you know, so get off of you know, watching people unpack GIFs and music videos and whatever else on YouTube and start learning. Uh, so that's where there's an empowerment, uh, but obviously people have to get activated to want to be empowered. Uh, but then on the teacher side, the empowerment is teachers historically, you know, they'll give a lecture, they'll assign some homework. They don't get a lot of information. They don't get a lot of data. And then by the time they administer the test, they have some data. They know who knew the material and who didn't. Then the class has to move on to the next concept. So they can't act on that data. Uh, also, teachers have to spend a lot of time doing things like making assignments, grading assignments, lesson plans, uh, which aren't really teaching. Uh, I mean, it's part of the process. And so I think there's a world where tools like Khan Academy 
obviously we talked about the students being able to learn at their own time and pace, but the teachers can get real time data, dashboards, understand where students are, have a sense of what interventions are going to be best for the students. A lot of this stuff is auto graded um, so that the teachers can spend more of their time on the interactions, which I believe teachers enjoy too. The teachers enjoy those really human, human to human uh, uh, interaction. So, you know, in my mind, that's the key. And if we are able to do the credentialing side as well, that's another level of empowerment. Because right now, there's really incredible kids. They might go to a regional university, do wonderfully, but if they move to the neighboring state or the neighboring country, you know, they, they might not get uh, the same opportunity. Or, you know, a rich kid who goes to a famous high school or a famous university um, today gets more opportunities than a, a student who goes to a lesser known university that might cost less money. Uh, but I think if we can do the credentialing side, that would also be a very powerful form of empowerment. Yeah. Well, I, I find really amazing that when, when I read the figures of your, how, how you access to 60 million, I heard, uh, users now in your platform. This is really global. This is really sustainable. Uh, but at the same time, you're aware that, uh, well, it's not the same to access to your contents from a county in California or from a country in Africa, and of course the, 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 the dependence on technology also produces a, a gap, right? A technological gap for these uh, countries to catch up, for these societies to catch up. How, how are we going to sort that out from a sustainability point of view? I mean, how are we going to make all these people, billions of people all over, uh, can access to your pills of knowledge? This, of course, yeah. uh, goes beyond education itself, right? But uh, how do how we do it? Yeah, I think, you know, there's an answer, you know, pre-COVID, you're absolutely right. You know, even in, in industrialized countries in Spain and the United States, you still had 20, 30 percent of the population that didn't really have adequate connections at sure. home. And obviously we're seeing that as a major issue now with, with COVID. And then if you look globally, the numbers are actually closer to 60, 70 percent don't have adequate access. Pre-COVID, the, the good thing is that the trends were you know, adoption of cell phones with data plans, the cost of data plans, adoption of broadband, you know, you have SpaceX putting up Starlink, which might create, you know, a global network of internet access at 100 megabit. I was just reading an article before coming on here where, you know, even if you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you're going to be able to get 100 megabits per second from, <laughs> from, this, uh, from these satellites, and it'll be very cheap. So that's the trend. So, you know, it's been unfortunate that a lot of folks couldn't access today. But you know, where we were going was in 10 years, it should be accessible. Now, COVID, I think, has accelerated all of that because it has made it very clear that having internet connection at home and a device at home is not a luxury. It's like having clean drinking water. It is like having heat. It is like having electricity. And you know, what we're seeing is globally, a lot of school districts, a lot of municipalities, a lot of philanthropists are taking this very seriously and doing what they can to connect folks. And, you know, as you mentioned, it's not just about academic learning. This is about being connected to society. This is about economic empowerment and being able to do remote work, being able to look for jobs and frankly, just mental health. I, I don't, you know, if we didn't have video conferencing right now, <clears throat> how would we stay in touch with people? Uh, it would, it would be incredibly, incredibly difficult. So, uh, and, and, you know, when you look at the, the, the money, it's not cheap, but it's also much, it's a small part of, you know, a lot of governments are doing massive stimulus programs. In the United States, we've done two rounds of a trillion dollars each uh, of stimulus. To get every, every family in the United States internet access would be maybe $10 billion, the ones that don't have it. So it's 1%. Yep. Uh, and I think that would be the best 1% spent out of the whole trillion dollars. And I think sure. the same thing is true globally. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I think that we are probably it's very, very interesting, but we probably need to start thinking of uh, a couple of questions, if that's okay from you. I just, before ending the conversation, I wanted to let you know we are starting here uh, the course in a couple of weeks uh, at the university and all over the Basque Country and Spain with the, with the schools. Uh, you are probably also facing this situation in your own school, uh, the Can Lab School. Can you tell us, can you try to cheer us up or encourage us or inspire us on how we face this uh, uh, COVID situation, the coming back to the, to the class, half in person, half remote, maybe fully remote, uh, how we feel optimistic and enthusiastic. How, what should we hold to? Tell us something for teachers and for students, which are the most important ones. 
Yeah. So, so you know, I, I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, you know, don't waste a good crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's some very serious problems going on right now. I mean, we've talked about the 10, 20, 30 percent of students who don't have access. So that's a very big problem. On the other hand, you know, I think for the other 70 percent and I think for, you know, a, a lot of your students and a lot of the folks in the room, this time is very unsettling. It's very anxiety inducing on multiple levels, on a health level, economic level, education level. But it's also a time of where I think there's so much opportunity to experiment, to try new things. And it's going to be a temporary period. So I think, you know, for the young people listening and for the teachers listening, I don't think you're going to get another opportunity in your life to experiment and try new things as you're going to right now. And no one's going to judge. You know, if you try something and it doesn't work, people are like, okay, yeah, not, a lot of things aren't working right now. But if you try something and it works, then that can have a lot of positive uh, benefits as we get through this crisis. And so, you know, from a student point of view, yes, it is suboptimal. Uh, but once again, there's a lot of tools, a lot of opportunities. Uh, you're in the driver's seat on your learning. And I think, you know, young people can be very, very creative at figuring out solutions of every one of these dimensions, on the academic dimension, the social emotional dimension, how do we help others? Are there ways to still get socialization in person that's done in very safe ways, meet at a park in a COVID safe way, do that more regularly? Um, there could be new learning models. You know, at, at our school, uh, we're trying to uh, get a waiver from the county to allow at least the five-year-olds to come and do outdoor learning. And I'm excited about that because I frankly think that we should have always been doing outdoor learning. I actually think it's better for kids to be learning outdoors under a tent, even if it's cold and they have to wear a jacket and it's raining. I still think that's better for them than sitting in a classroom with no windows open and having to stare at a chalkboard. Just being in nature, that's how we're, we're supposed to be as human beings, especially as, as young kids. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of things that will push us, push our thinking, uh, but it'll push us in a good way. And when we look back at this time, I think there's going to be some very bad outcomes. I think there's going to be 10, 15, 20 percent of our global population that will become disengaged in, in learning and, and that we have to try to figure out innovative ways of stopping that. But I think many of us will also reflect that this was a time that we questioned a lot of norms and we realized that there were a lot of, you know, a lot of the things we were doing didn't make sense. And when, when we questioned them, uh, they're, they're starting to, they're, you know, we, we get a lot more opportunity to, to do things, to rebuild in the right way. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, we could keep talking for hours, of course, and listening to you and uh, brainstorming. But uh, I think that it might be the, the right time to, to, to get a couple of questions from the audience in person here, and also a couple of questions from people who have been following in the chat and in the room, uh, in the video online, uh, the conversation, and want to ask something. That uh, We can start maybe by a couple of questions by the audience uh, for Mr. Khan. So anybody can feel free to, to ask Mr. Khan. About anything. About education and sustainability mainly, right? <laughs> or education or sustainability. <laughs> you, you, I, I hope you see the, the room here. It's a room with about 30 people conveniently separated with our masks, keeping the protocol of COVID distance and being very cautious about all we do. So. <laughs> Um, I'm, 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 very, I'm very impressed. Uh, I have, yeah, the, how y'all are, are pulling this off? I'm, I'm the only one allowed without a mask here now. Yeah. <laughs> no question from the audience? I see a question on the chat from... Yes, I, I have questions from the chat here. We might pass to the chat directly if there are no questions in the audience. I have... Uh, for someone can this question, you have achieved the difficult task that many kids all over the world uh, love mathematics through your academy, right? Uh, but on top of the mathematics and the technical skills, what could we do as teachers, this is a question by a teacher, to encourage the respect to nature, uh, environment, and to build up a more sustainable uh, world. So what can we teachers do to, to encourage and to build up uh, this uh, respect? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think as human beings, we 
we kind of start very connected to nature. It's, it's, you know, it's obviously where we evolved as a species for, you know, even for the, you know, human beings have existed in modern form for two or 300,000 years. And most of those two or 300,000 years, we were in nature in close connection with it. And only really in the last uh, few thousand years have we kind of abstracted nature away. And so I think a lot of it is just coming back in, you know, this notion of when you go outside, um, even if the weather's not good, you feel more alive. I think I'm speaking for everyone. And, you know, this idea that right now we have kids in these fairly sterile classrooms, you know, with cinder blocks. And, you know, a lot of these classrooms were designed in the 40s and 50s and 60s, 70s, where the theory was we can't give them windows because then it'll be distracting. We can't give them fresh air. We can't because we want them to be, you know, do what they're told. And, and I think, you know, the more that we can take kids outside, do classes outside, I think it's going to be energizing for everybody, for students and, and for teachers. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that COVID has done is, you know, the, 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 the little socialization that folks, you know, even on a personal level that I've been doing and our family's been doing, we've been meeting people in parks, we've been meeting people in backyards. Uh, and, you know, before we used to say, oh, it's a little bit too cold or it rained, the grass is wet. We would have all these reasons to not go outside. Uh, but now COVID is forcing us outside. And I have to say that this has improved my mood tremendously. Like I, I'm enjoying it, even if it's a little bit, you know, uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable in a very positive way. And then it does just make you more connected. It makes you more pre appreciative of the air quality, more appreciative of just uh, attuned to what's going on. I think a lot of what we can do as adults is also just set very clear examples. You know, a lot of us will, will talk about you know, climate change and this and that, and then we'll get on a plane just to have a half an hour meeting with somebody and we'll burn, you know, who knows how much fuel for that. Um, it's far more sustainable, frankly, to do what we're doing right now uh, to, you know, who, who knows how much carbon I would have generated if I, if I were there on, in person. And there's some benefits to being in person for sure, uh, but there's a lot of negatives. Um, and I, I'm, I'm somewhat biased. I, I don't like planes. I like getting there. I don't like the planes themselves. So I think there's a lot of things that, that we can rethink in how we relive their life. You know, people, remote work. Uh, this is a trend that I think we're going to see post COVID. It's going to, it's going to be much more sustainable on a bunch of levels. Traffic is going to go down. Fuel consumption is going to go down. People are going to spend more time with their family. They're going to have more time. It's going to be more sustainable for their lives. They're not going to be as stressed. So I think, you know, COVID might be forcing some of this and, and we just have to set an example for, for kids. Sure, there's another question here. Well, there's so many questions, but uh, we are going to select uh, one last one probably. It says, uh, you say that reading, writing, and maths are the basics, right, in education. But in your opinion, what else could teacher add to these basics to move towards sustainable behavior? So actually, this is something I have heard you several times saying, to define sustainable education or, or an education with, uh, which is sustainable as based on not doing less, but, but concentrating in the basics uh, in a reduced set of very strong foundations of, of knowledge, but to do that very, very well, right? So is that enough, or we also need to pay attention to these, uh, to these uh, behaviors and sustainable behaviors? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the statistic I often give, and it's a similar statistic in most of, in most um, industrialized countries. But in, in the United States, if you look at community colleges, uh, you know, so these are places where people get an associate's degree, 70%, 70% of all kids have to take remedial courses. Uh, these are essentially courses that you normally need to learn that material when you're 12 or 13 years old. Uh, in four-year colleges in the U.S., 25% of students have to take remedial courses uh, because the universities determine they're not even ready to learn algebra. And you actually see similar statistics throughout the world in Europe and other places. And so what's happening is that, you know, as oftentimes, you know, in education conversations, everyone says, oh, we need to cover this. Oh, we need to cover this too. We need to cover that too. And, and we end up trying to do so much for so, in so many directions that everyone gets spread thin. And so in the system, everyone's taking all of these courses, but the reality is they're not retaining much of it at all. Uh, and then, you know, they get to college or, you know, I, I could imagine, imagine, any of us being assessed on what we learned in college, how many of those things would we even remotely pass? <laughs> it's a, the retention is, is, is very, very low. And, uh, and, and there's certain skills that if you don't retain them, they're debilitating your whole life. And so, you know, I sound very traditional when I say reading, writing, and mathematics. You know, these have always been, you know, the three R's, the traditional things, but it is true. 
if you don't have basic mm -hmm. mastery of mathematics, solid reading comprehension, and solid ability to write, you're going to be at a disadvantage your entire life, and you're not going to be able to engage in other subjects. Uh, you know, and things like the arts, the sciences, social sciences are incredibly important. But if you don't really understand reading, writing, and mathematics well, you're never going to really get an opportunity to engage deeply in any of these other things. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what I tell, I, I was just came out of a board meeting yesterday with our lab school. I said, you know, it's always hard to say we have to do less. It's always hard to take things out. Uh, but if we do fewer things, it does, it, it liberates us to make sure we do it well, that the kids can really master it. And it also frees up time for kids to pursue their passions. Because when you try to make every student do everything, that means that no one has time to go deep into what they really care about or to explore what they care about. For some kids, that exploration might be they want to start writing software. For another student, it might be they want to write a novel. For another student, it might be that they want to do visual arts or dance. And it, it, you know, for one student, one year it might be they want to write software and then they realize that the next year they want to do dance. But in a traditional system, when we make people do six or seven things all at the same time, you can never go deep in any one subject and really immerse yourself. And you know, as a researcher, uh, imagine if you were doing six subjects, you wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to go deep. Anyone who's ever done anything deep, who's really developed a passion, uh, has had a lot of time and a lot of space to dig deep into it. Uh, so yeah, I'm a big believer, even pre-COVID, of focus, you know, have a, a small set of the things you really need to master and make sure you master it, and then have a lot of flexibility above and beyond that uh, to, to pursue your interests. And then COVID makes this even more important because right now, a lot of educators, a lot of families are feeling in a lot of stress. Uh, you know, how are we going to do six subjects when we're doing it remote and the parents have to, you know, make sure the kids are doing it. It's just adding stress to things. And COVID, if kids are getting their math, their reading, their writing, those skills aren't atrophying, then they're going to be fine. And once people feel good about those, that they're doing it in a sustainable, a personally sustainable way, then yes, layer on other things. Uh, but don't try to force everything at once because that could sometimes... Uh, lead to everything getting watered down. Well, I, I think that with this uh, advice, I think uh, uh, we can kind of wrap up the, the whole conversation. I think that it's very important what just uh, Salman Khan said. I mean, to, to go deeper, more sophisticated in concepts, in sustainability, in a crisis situation like this, let's go back to a little bit of reduction, go to the basics, do a little bit less, but do it very well and this will set the foundations and the basis for developing into more sustainable education, sophisticated concepts, and education for sustainability, right? So with that, I would, uh, I would get that message uh, uh, from all the things, but uh, everything was very interesting. I think that if nobody else wants to add anything in the audience, I think I would like to, to, to thank Salman Khan for, for all this exchange and, and interaction with us and sharing your views on education and sustainability with us. It was really great to, to know your opinions, to share your experiences, and I think we all enjoy it very much. It's a great beginning for our platform on sustainability with a big pillar, which is education. We all are aware of that, and I really, really heartily appreciate uh, your presence here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So with this, I think uh, I would like to give the word to Itziar or to, to somebody to close the, the dialogue. And that's it. I will put myself here again. Esquerra Caspo de Noi, Etorcea Gatí. Vamos a concluir eh, esta sesión. Eh, desgraciadamente no vamos a poder compartir eh, nada que nos pueda infectar. Por tanto, eh, os voy a pedir que procedamos, eh, si queréis, eh, tenemos un pequeño respirador detrás, si queréis estar un rato, y después unos magníficos jardines y vistas para poder charlar y disfrutar de vuestra presencia. Es que ricasco de Noi Veneta negote gati que ta espero dugu plataforma honetan aurkitzea Leicester, su egustia. Es que ricasco.